Pelican fans, welcome back. It's Zach Miller, Peter Hale. This is the Midtown Madness podcast. Before we get going, thank you guys so much for listening. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe down below, as well as the bell to get notified, you know, whenever we drop an episode. Uh, this episode and the whole season and spoiler alert, next season uh, of the Midtown Madness podcast is brought to you by Two Men and a Garden. Uh, whether you like it mild or hot, chunky or cantina style, the people over at Two Men have you covered. I know what you're asking. Why Two Men in a Garden? Because they are GD delicious. Uh, the salsa is off the charts good. Um, I, I want to take some time. Uh, a, a, uh, a baseball player's dad reached out to us, uh, told us that he loved, liked, he enjoys our show. Um, you all right there, Peter? Couldn't get to the mute button in time. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, I thought Peter was convulsing for a second. He is not. Uh, but a baseball player's dad reached out and said he ordered some two men in a garden uh, because he heard about it on our show. Uh, and actually, then we got a DM from uh, the guys over at Two Men Salsa, and they showed us the receipt with the note uh, on there uh, from that dad. It was easy to put two and two together. Uh, on that one, but unbelievable. Anybody who has gone out and bought a single jar of two minute garden salsa because you heard about it here, I cannot thank you enough. You have made a world of difference to this podcast. You you are going to help this podcast continue to run at least at a zero cost for another year. Uh, so thank you so, so much for uh, taking that burden off myself and Peter. Um, Pete. Uh, you know, you can pick their products up at any local grocery store or online at two men in a garden.com. I do know that Zach. Yes. And you can also follow them on social media at two men salsa. They're on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, Pete, uh, this show, we've got no drama. It's going to be a great show. We're very excited about next season. Uh, all the, the rosters coming together. Uh, everything's great, right? Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's general consensus around the men's basketball program right now. Sure. Oh my gosh. Well, there there's a lot to talk about on the on the men's basketball side, and I I wanted to start off a little bit lighter because some 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 just a bummer of of a news headline to come across our our Twitter uh, today. Uh, probably the first Billiken coach that both you and I were were firsthand aware of. Uh, passed away uh, at April on April 13th at the age of 78, Pete. Yeah, it's, it was Marilyn Nolan, who was um, the volleyball coach uh, when I showed up on campus, actually. She she was the coach from 94 to 2003. So she left uh, to re retired um, about halfway through my time at SLU uh, with a record of 190 and 140. She was a good coach, a, a legendary coach, Zach. I mean, she, she coached... Uh, I, how many programs here? I'm counting them up right now. She had five teams at SLU with 20 or more wins. She won 29 games in 95 at SLU and Conference USA Coach of the Year in 98. Um, but she also coached at New Mexico State, Utah State, Kentucky, Florida, North Florida. She had 809 wins in a 33-year career in D1. That's the 16th most wins ever at that level. Um, but when she retired in 03, she went back to coach at Sul Ross State uh, actually she took some time off and then in 2013 went back to coach there. And that's where she began her career out in West Texas. Um, so, so really a, a, a decorated coaching career and she was a really nice person, Zach, too. I, I don't know how much when, you know, when you were younger and running around campus in those days, how much you interacted with her, but having shared West Pine gym and I know, you know, head volleyball coach and an underclassman, um, men's basketball manager may not be in the same exact same orbit, but it's a small facility and you kind of get to know people a little bit. She was, she was really nice. Yeah. A really special person. Uh, not even like, cause I really, I mean, again, you talk about a volleyball coach and a freshman in college, you know, a, uh, you know, nine year old. Um, <laughs> well, I, she, she kind of does run in that circle kind of circle as, as a, as kind of an older uh, woman. Uh, and I say that because she gave birth to twins at the age of 55, Peter. 
Yeah, that really surprised me. I, I never I never knew that, honestly. I, I probably should have. Maybe it's one of those things I had heard and forgotten, but but yeah, wow, that's that's incredible. I can tell you as a a person who is 40 and has young kids, I can't imagine starting again in uh, you know 15 years from now. That's incredible. I, I I don't know how she has the energy or the the patience or or, or any of that that it takes to uh so let alone twins. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard work. Yeah. She goes actually uh, it, not in coaching circles. She goes by, or she went by Marilyn McCreevy Nolan. Um, and she was actually also a minister's wife. So she did that too. Uh, she was actually, a, a, I, I, I'm kind of skipping uh, details here because her, she was the sub half of the subject of an article uh, in the, uh, June 2nd, 2006 uh, edition of The Guardian, um, basically about her becoming a mom uh, in her golden years, I guess you would say. Um, at an age when most people are looking forward to winding down, the former Olympian, Nolan played volleyball for the U.S. in 68 and 72 Olympics, is embarking on the equivalent of a late life triathlon, which I find that funny. Uh, that, that line's funny. Uh, she was 55 years old when she gave birth to her twins, Ryan and Travis in March, 2000. She will be seven. She was going to be 73 by the time they're old enough to vote or go off to college. Uh, she said, raising the boys, or they said, raising the boys, had been an adventure. Um, by the time Ryan and Travis were three months old, they were in their car seats and on the road with Nolan and the rest of the uh, rest of the volleyball team. They were, they would go, they would go on trips, obviously with the team, which is, uh, wild, wild, wild. And, uh, and now, and now looking back, I'm, I'm not sure how I like, don't remember it or whatever. I, Maybe I thought they were somebody else or grandkids or something. And, and that's my own, you know, bias or anything as, as a, as an ignorant 19, 20 year old at the mm. time. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't really, I don't really remember that so much. It's, it's wild though. I, I, you know what? I'm, I don't, I'm not going to try to, I'm not one upping here, but I, I actually do like, I, I remembered this, mm. like it always stuck in my head because I think like, I think, you know, I spent all that time with my uncle there and at, at games and he would put that in perspective for me as much as you can for a nine-year-old. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I remember seeing uh, her boys walking around in matching outfits. I think, I think there was a, a picture or I have this, this picture in my head of her walking hand in hand down that vestibule of uh of West Pine Gym, that main entryway. Mm -hmm. Like she's walking out in that uh what do you call that? A foyer? I don't know. The lobby. But yeah, the lobby, thank you. Um, so I I I do have that memory in my head, but uh, but when they were three, she did retire and, and move to Texas. Uh, that was obviously in 2003. This was kind of an interesting exercise for me because looking at like, I, I got to figure out exactly my first year of seeing Billiken volleyball. And that was 97 uh, because I, all these players, I mean, the, just some entry, like some names on this team that are just kind of like Il Ilya Filipova, Laura Risley. These are all names that like, I, I was like, oh, these, these girls can play. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was just a nine-year-old kid, like staring up at these massive, you know, massively tall volleyball players. <laughs> yeah. Just blew my mind at the time. And, um, uh, I remember the, one of the first games I went to, I got, uh, this was when she was still coaching. Cause I remember all the names. So they used to sign all the balls. Like they used to sign the, the souvenir balls they throw out with like lineups. They'd sign them. And it was so cool because like the team had so many personalities on it. I think I, I got to go look at my mom's house. Cause I know this ball is still around somewhere mm -hmm. and I'll bring it out. But it's like, you know, like one of the girls wrote her name in big block letters on the entire like little panel of the volleyball, which I thought was kind of neat and quirky and fun, but uh, yeah, no Marilyn Nolan. Um, yeah. Uh, passes away at the age of, I'm sorry, uh, 78. I was still on the article. You know, before we move on, I also wanted to point out she was quite a player in her yeah. day too. Like she was, she won gold with the U.S. Women's National Team at the Pan Am Games in '67, and the next year she was on the Olympic team, um, and then continued to play internationally for the U.S. through 1975. It's it's just it, uh, just an incredible experience that she's had. The A10 actually named her a Title IX Trailblazer last year to mark the 50th anniversary 
of of the passage of the law um so so she's been i mean she's kind of a legend she's she's really been around the sport and college sports and women's sports uh for a really long time it feels like volleyball is one and i think that i think when you talk about you know winning the gold medal at the pan am games at the olympics i i think vol it's it's a bigger accomplishment i think than maybe softball or women's basketball or you know um women's tennis or wait women's tennis is probably the biggest accomplishment right but like the game i the volleyball is so international Mm -hmm. so like south america huge into volleyball brazil argentina um and then you've got the the eastern Bloc nations that are big big into volleyball so i I do think that that's a a much bigger accomplishment than say uh women's soccer in the late 70s or something like that yeah where the u.s kind of had a at an advantage for a while and it took some time for the rest of the world to catch up yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. But uh, yeah, Marilyn Nolan, uh, she'll be missed. She was, she was cool, cool lady. Yeah. She was definitely kind of that. Uh, it, it feels like she kind of was in that role of, of Lisa stone uh, for, for women's volleyball, where a, a coach with a ton of experience comes in in the, in the later end of her career to, to uh, you know, bring life into a program that just has really nothing going for it. Yeah. Um, so uh absolutely instrumental to uh, what became of the volleyball team under uh, Ann Cordes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, Pete, we're out of the men's basketball team. And uh, dude, I. (laughs) Did you mute yourself there for a minute, Zach, or was that just screaming into the abyss? That was screaming into the abyss. I'm uh, a master of, of censoring myself. Um, <laughs> well, why, why don't we start with the, the, the big, probably the biggest news of the week, which is, Oh, I'm, actually it's, it's I hard know. to say, it's hard to say. I know the biggest news I, you the week started is. that sentence and I had, I, I could have flipped the coin because <laughs> I had no idea what you were going to pick. So we've got two departures two two depart one, one, and an actual one never departure, showed up and one. Yeah. A departure of a sort. Uh, we, we have Brock Weiss who decommitted. He was one of the three incoming high school seniors and then Phil Forte, an assistant coach leaving. And I I think we'll go with that one first because he left, uh, to take an assistant coaching job at North Texas under new head coach, Ross Hodge, North Texas won the NIT this year. They've won conference USA three straight years. Pretty impressive because the top of that conference, the top few teams have actually been pretty strong recently with like UAB coming back and, and, and a couple other teams like that. Um, obviously Florida Atlantic this year. Uh, but even with the coaching change, I think the program is in pretty good shape. North Texas is in Denton, which is about 25 minutes north of where Forte grew up and went to high school in Flower Mound, Texas. He went to Marcus High School. Um, so that makes it like the closest D1 school to where he's from. Uh, not quite five minutes, like Coach Ford said, but, you know, in Dallas terms, it might as well be. Um, so that 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 also probably means that this is going to be the end or at least a really significant slowing of our recruitment of Texas, right? Because if you look at our recruiting list right now, um, SLU currently has five 2024 offers out and four 2025 offers out to Texas recruits, not to mention dozens more that we've shown interest in, but not offered yet. Um, so, uh, so, so there's, there's definitely going to be a big shift in our recruiting makeup our recruiting strategy. Now, coach Ford said he, he's got a ton of calls about the job already, but uh, you know, we'll see what we do w- with this spot and how fast it happens. Um, but, you know, coach Forte came on the show, Zach. I mean, he's, you know, what we yeah. would call a friend of the show. Yeah. Um, good guy, young guy, a lot of energy, good recruiter. It was starting to pay dividends. And, um, you know, it's, I knew there was a coaching change there, but it still kind of took me by surprise. Yeah. I think we both talked about how we wanted to see a shakeup of the staff and it's hard to say, uh, you know, when of course the staff has been, you know, we inter, I, I interact with these guys occasionally. Um, you know, we, as a, as a show, we interact with them, you know, on mm-hmm. social media and, uh, you know, you don't want to see somebody necessarily lose a job. And I think, I think coaching is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting world where if, you know, a, a head coach 
says, you know, we need to change some things up on the assistant side. They very often, you know, are already making calls for the coach before, uh, before they even talk to them. Right. So, so do you think that's what this was? And it no, wasn't, no, it wasn't no, 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 I'm yeah. saying like, I think it's easier to put it in perspective where you, where we can sit here and talk about, Hey, maybe it's time to try something new on the coaching staff, a new, a, a new Avenue to go down. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, but you don't want to see a coach leave. I mean, that's, it's, it's different. It's change. It's you, you get, it's like on senior night when you kind of, you know, you, you used to anyway, watch guys for four years and then they, they, right. you don't get them again, you get them the next year. And it's, it's sad. It, it's, it's emotional. And um, I wish Phil all the best, unless he was that secret coach that we heard that dumb tweet about. <laughs> I mean, how ridiculous of a, of a confluence of events. Well, and it, especially to hear us talking about that last week with a hundred percent certainty that it could have been a, a slew coach, right? That it, it, yeah. there was no way it was uh, what was one of our guys. And then the next day he leaves for North Texas, but uh, we haven't seen a big exodus of, of you know, existing well, players and recruits with him. We depending saw one on, big one. I mean, he's, he's a big boy. Depending on where vice ends up. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I guess, uh, I guess we can get to that well, now. Well, I think it's funny. I don't remember if we talked about this last year or not last year, last episode. Uh, but it was funny how quick of a leap that Billiken nation went into like, let's hire Chris Harriman. <laughs> uh, yeah. Which, which again, big Chris Harriman fan. Yeah. Uh, I thought, I think he's one of the nicest guys uh, that was all, I, I mean, he was a su- I won't say that because I don't know him that well enough. Uh, that's a hell of a leap. But I mean, he's a guy who's been through uh, incredible personal family adversity. Yep. Uh, he's a guy who uh, filled in for Majerus admirably while he was sick. Um, and uh, just was very nice to me when he was here. Um, and But it, it's funny because one person posts, and they don't even mean to post about Chris Harriman. Mm-hmm. They mean to post about Al Jensen. And then somebody, and then somebody corrects them, and then people start waxing uh, <laughs> nostalgic about Chris Harriman, and then everybody's like, "What's Chris Harriman up to?" Oh, he didn't get retained at Cal. Oh, he was great. Let's go get Harriman. Right. I was like, okay, fine. Like Harriman's a great guy. I just never really, I he to me he was the Australian link recruiting assistant. You know, I never really got the, the, you know, strategic genius side. I never saw that. So again, I don't know. I mean, I, I think with a, a lot of it with assistance is kind of what we project on them, right? Mm-hmm. And and I I really was impressed. I remember vividly those games where he stepped in for Majerus when Majerus was out on a few, you know, odd games. And it, and if you couldn't see the coach on the sideline, you a hundred percent would not have known. You just wouldn't have. And when I, and, and, and I think I put a little more stock into that than most people would, because when I was a manager at SLU, there were a couple of games where Soderberg, um, you know, got a bad flu bug or something like that. And an assistant have to, would have to fill in. And I really noticed, you know, when, <laughs> when his, when his assistant, I, you know, I don't want to name a name or anything mm. like that. I, are, you, are you throwing Angus Thorpe under the bus? It wasn't Angus. It oh, wasn't oh, Angus. I was going to say. Angus but, Thorpe. but hey, 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 shout out Angus Thorpe. He showed up at my uncle's funeral. God bless him. He's he's an incredibly good dude. I, I yes. love I, I yes. don't have a negative thing. The to say only about guy to hold over with Majerus. But I think um, you know, we saw a big difference in in kind of like just how the sideline operated in one game. You know, it was it was it was really eye-opening. And you're like, wow, they, okay. So there's there is a very big game day component of this, right? It's not a guy doesn't get sick and the thing just runs on autopilot. You got to be ready. And so I was, I was really impressed in those times when Harriman did that, not to mention, you know, recruiting the other side of the world and, and, and being good at that and finding really good fits yeah. for the program um, guys who really fit the system and, and, and who, who got it, who were good students and good dudes and uh, you know, um, Aussie 
crazy Aussie, uh, you know, guys who could drink Zach under the table. They really <laughs> freaking could. Good but, but, Lord, could they? But I mean, um, so so I think I I'm a little bit more of a Harriman fan, probably just because I was I was so impressed by that at the time. And and like, look, you can look at his stops since then, right? And I don't know how much stock you put in an assistant into like the outcomes into the the overall record at those programs yeah. but he went to nebraska he went to new mexico in, in a kind of a stretch when they were down a little bit right because new mexico's traditionally been at the top of the mountain where they're a strong basketball program with a you know legendary venue and a rich tradition and a huge fan base out there um and they weren't very good in those years they were kind of hovering around 500 little above that it was the same story at nebraska right before that and then uh, when he was at Cal, I mean, it was it was kind of a disaster of a few years there. So I I don't know how much stock to put in that um, yeah. compared to what I saw at SLU and was so impressed at because with because for the last decade the 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 head coaches that he's worked with have not really put up great great records. Those are all you know tricky jobs for one, especially Nebraska and Cal, not traditionally strong programs in really tough conferences. But um, I, yeah, I, I don't know what to make of that. But regardless, I, I, I always liked him. But I think people kind of get comfortable with what they know, right? And it's like, you look at Travis Ford and, and you know, to him, Harriman is one of hundreds, if not, I guess, more than a thousand assistants mm -hmm. out there in D1 who he may or may not really know. And coaching is a small fraternity and it seems like everybody knows everybody. But I don't think just because he was at SLU a few years before Travis that that, that would make a um, a big difference. Yeah. I think that honestly, like I really like that he has spent all this time as an assistant. And I think it's, I think it's interesting, you know, I think that probably is molded by my time watching Travis Ford uh, and his teams here at SLU, you know, it's molded in that, you know, maybe it's one of those things where, I'd like to see something different if we go uh, away from Travis Ford eventually at some point. Uh, I wouldn't, I would love to see Harriman get a shot. He got, he's got that kind of like, you know, um, that uh, Dennis Gates experience kind of where he's mm -hmm. been an assistant forever. Mm -hmm. Like he's just soaking in everything he can from all these different places. And, you know, maybe, maybe his time's coming yeah yeah very very well could um it, it would just help if like his last stop had been a place that they had won a lot right you know instead of a place where a coach just got fired um you know and he did he did fill in for him while he was gone but i i he just didn't have a lot to work with there um unfortunately yeah uh well again harriman is not necessarily even a candidate i just thought it was funny yeah how, and how that came quickly up how quickly the wave can swell. Yeah. Um, and speaking of quick uh, swelling waves, uh, the wave of just depression that ran, that just ran right over me the other day uh, yeah. was unreal. Um, Brock Weiss, the big man, the 6'11", 280, whatever, the center slash power forward slash tight end um out of Tennessee. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me Memphis area. Yeah, he has decommitted from the Billikens. I mean, I will say that like with uh Forte leaving and Forte being the lead recruiter of Vice, it didn't come out of nowhere. But I'd be lying if I didn't say what the hell. I think the toughest part about this one is it was at a time where I felt like SLU really needed some good news. Yes. We'd missed on some transfer targets, you know, some very high profile transfer targets missed on those guys. Uh, we got one in Nolan, but there were, there were some others that we really wanted and didn't get. And we're hoping for some good news. Right. And, and instead of on the heels of missing out on those targets, hearing about an assistant coach leaving, and it's already been a little bit of a, yeah, I don't know if tumultuous is the right word. But kind been, of a, we almost had a coup, Peter. It's been a there was an attempted coup. 
so 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 we hear so it's been rumored but alleged it's been, attempted to. it's been a stressful off season and we we were due for some good news and instead we got some bad news and i think it was it was really that kind of it was the timing right because if you pull back and think about it you're like yeah his lead recruiter just um, left for another job his dad who's an assistant football coach at the d1 level who was at virginia tech is now going to be out at unlv so he's you know there's a transition there too. Might have him thinking a little bit about his options. Um, so if you if you pull back and think about this, you're like, okay, yeah, you're right. It's not out of nowhere. But man, this this timing, it was just uh, it was just not not great. I mean, you know, and and look, he 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 showed out in a recent All Star game. You never know what the NIL conversations are happening. I mean, we'd be naive to think that uh, as soon as a guy commits or even signs that he gets left alone. So so who knows. But 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 do you think it's that? Do you think it's the the football job? Do you think it's Forte leaving? Is there is there something else going on here? All of the above? Yeah, I think I mean I think there's something always in the it, 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 there's always something, right? And it's always somewhere in the middle is always the truth. Yeah. Um, you know, I it's one of those. It's a wild thing because it doesn't like to me. It's like he was gonna get unbelievable amount of playing time i i the opportunity was certainly there at least right now right i mean like there there's not much in the front court i mean it's it's the young the young bigs right i mean so yeah. so you you had to think like it couldn't have been a lack of opportunity even if slew uh gets multiple guys in the portal he was still going to have a shot for some minutes here um oh, i don't yeah. think we we're going to do that thing now where we're just like stacking centers um I think they're they're looking for a more built out front court. Um so so yeah, he certainly was going to have an opportunity especially cuz his game's kind of unique. He's he's not just a, a post big man. He had really developed a a, a perimeter game. Um so so he was going to get a real opportunity even as a freshman at SLU and on a roster in transition. So it it couldn't have just been that cuz there aren't many places he would go and just like have, have more of an opportunity that at slew, especially at this level. Um, so, so it's going to be interesting to see what he does, but I, now, you know, more to the point for slew fans is like, should we be worried about the other two incoming players? Sion Medley, Bruce Young. Um, how solid are those guys? I mean, like the, I think they were both forte um, lead recruits as well. Yeah, I don't know. I think everybody has their own reasons for coming to school. And I think, yeah, like I think it's, I kind of think about these like recruits becoming close, like going on a cruise. Like you go on, like, <laughs> like you know, like you go, like, like before they step on campus, right? You step on campus, your teammates, that's another thing, right? But yeah. like the, these guys, they, they text, you know, or they, they meet on official visits. They hang out on a weekend and then they go their separate ways. They text, they social media, they Snapchat, whatever. That sounds like friends I had on a Disney cruise like 20 years ago. Yeah. And every once in a while they pop up on your Facebook feed and you're like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember that guy. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's just how I, I view it. So I don't, I don't know, you know, how tight these guys were or how I don't think Zhang is going to be an issue. Right. Um, Zhang has already gone through so much with uncertainty in his, in his recruitment. I don't know. And I think, but, isn't he, isn't he currently back home again? I thought he was back in the States, but I have no idea. Yeah, I don't, I don't I, the last that. I saw he was in LA with, uh, the kid for uh, the kid that decommitted from South Florida. Oh, okay. Yo, yeah. Miles Che. Miles Che. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I I really don't. I don't think yeah, so. I don't good, think so. Yeah, right. It, but it, I, I would mean, have said same about uh, Vice. It, that's a, that, that's very true. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, all of these guys have been very positive in their social media and like you know reposting things that Slu has put out and and you know they they still seemed up until very recently gung ho. Yeah. Um, you just never know what changes. I think I'm I'm more worried about Medley. Um, again, a guy who's got a big opportunity at SLU right now on paper, but those open scholarships, you just never know. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, you know, obviously we're going to be watching the news closely and we're going to be following these guys closely. And 
Um, and hopefully we can hang on to both of them. Yeah, we are in a, a major hurt for some big men on this team. I think that's probably, I mean, that's very true, you know, which yeah. is what makes the, the vice thing all the more puzzling. I mean, he must really think he's got a good opportunity out there somewhere. Um, because I, I looked at Slu and thought, you know, here's your shot, kid. I mean, like, if you're ready to go, let's go. I, I thought of it like Rob Lowe, you know, getting all yeah. that run his freshman year and and, and playing a lot for years. Um, Vice had that that opportunity, I think. Oh, Peter. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, I wonder also how solid is his decommitment? Uh, yeah, you know, it, when I read the, the, and I don't have it pulled up in front of me right now, but I, when I read it as his announcement, to me, it sounded, he didn't, I don't know. It sounded like he was gone to me. Yeah. You know, there are other ones I read and think like they really left it open to, to come back. But in this case, I, I didn't read it that way. And the other, the other reason I think that is because a lot of times guys will decommit or, or ask to transfer or whatever the case may be when there's a coaching change but they kind of leave one foot in the door to kind of give themselves that room to come back. Right. Um, yeah. This, I mean, he, sure. He always could. Um, but, but the, the statement itself read to me, like it's, it's fairly conclusive that he, he would. Oh, fair enough. Uh, I was trying to, I was trying to hang on. I mean, uh, and, and look, anything's possible. He could be, he could be on campus tomorrow, the way things have gone. Uh, you know, this, this, this spring in, in this game right now. So who knows, but that's just my take on it. Yeah. Uh, CJ Noland uh, signed on the 15th to make it official. Pete, uh, the Billikens are officially a little thicker. Yeah, this is good news. I mean, like, you know, we needed some good news. We knew he committed, um, it, but, but having him sign after, Forte left it just kind of gives you a little more peace of mind right like it felt like a lot of things were kind of in flux uh but but he's committed you know his parents on social media have both uh you know already posted very team blueish kind of things and uh and they seem excited for him to get a new opportunity and uh, I think he'll be a great fit on a Travis Ward team so I'm really excited about him so a lot of uh bad to questionable news um, but that's one thing that does that does help mitigate that. Uh, in other transfer news, Peter, uh, we the Billikens have a visitor this weekend, Kashan Pryor. I'm assuming I got that right. Uh, SLU recruited him out of high school in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Pete, I got to admit on this one, I didn't get it at first because mm. I didn't look into it more. I just went straight to the stat line over at uh, Boise state uh, where he just legit didn't play. Right. Um, hardly at all. Uh, and I was very confused at this one, but yeah, now I mean, I'm in, I'm in now. And, uh, <laughs> you know, get, get, get into the, the nitty gritty here. So he's actually a guy I knew as soon as he came back up, um, his name popped up as a guy that we were interested in a few months ago, right? Um, his name was familiar to me immediately because we recruited him out of high school, um, which was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I think he went to Pioneer High School there. And then he went, I think he did a year at Link down in uh, Branson. Um, ended up at Boise State, but you're right, just didn't do much there. And then finally this past season played at Northwest Florida, uh, uh, which is a junior college, a really good one at that. And averaged almost 15 points again, game, eight rebounds and 1.7 assists. Uh, from the field, he shot 46%. He shot 35% from three, almost 80% from the free throw line. Uh, that team actually, the the Northwest Florida Raiders, coached by a former Travis Ford assistant and was the runner up in JUCO D1 this season. They they lost by three in the title game to John A. Logan College, which is in Illinois. They were actually ranked number one for a lot of the year. So this, this was a legit team, and he was a major piece of that. He's about 6'10", 200, and I think what you would say is he played kind of a stretch for the season. Boise didn't really use him as a front court player as much, right? I mean, my understanding is they kind of tried to make him a big guard or a wing, and um, you know when he played in more of a front court position, kind of a stretch big, he showed a lot more value as a rebounder, shot blocker, um, and then he, he moves, he passes, he scores. He's he's a he's a nice versatile player. 
um, can, can look a little unorthodox sometimes, you know, you kind of got to get used to watching him. And it's also, it's just kind of hard to say, right. In, in the Juco game, what translates, because it's such an open game. It's almost like watching guys in the off season scrimmage. Um, uh, and, and you might have guys who are, are in town from other schools or something like that. Uh, that's, that's kind of how Juco, you know, when I watch it, that's kind of what it looks like to me. It's a really different game. There's, there's, there's just not as much rigor, I think, to the, to the X's and O's. Um, so I really, I really want to see how all of that would translate at this level, given that he really didn't do much at Boise, but I don't know if that was a fit thing or what. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Again, I really liked what I saw of him as a stretch four. I saw a lot yeah. of athleticism that I really liked. Uh, and again, I didn't like him as a guard. I I said, great, another freaking wing. Uh, yeah. And I like him as a stretch four a lot. So we'll see. I, he kind of reminds me of like, I mean, he's 6'10". Jesus Christ. Well, that's the thing. He would be the second tallest player on the roster right now to Bruce. Yeah. Um, who's a seven footer. So um, so so the second tallest guy on, on this roster is that's, you know, it's he's, he's we're we're not gonna use him the way Boise did. You know, he's gonna be that kind of stretch for that's Willie Reed, man. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I don't know if he's quite got Willie's um Oh no, arms he doesn't have the ba- and he doesn't that, have the bounce. Length. No, yeah. We, I mean, yeah, hell Willie played in the NBA. I don't wanna I don't want to give an unfair comp, but you, you're physically right. Physically I mean, speaking, physically he does have about that. He is about that size um, to kind of give people some some bearings there, um, and that's just not you know that's just not someone you're going to see in the backcourt along you know Medley and Nolan or anything. Um, so uh, I, I you know I I like the uh, look Ford has been going the three things that he's talking about are uh, defense, rebounding, and athleticism, right? And 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 I think you kind of get all three of that three of those attributes here he he does disrupt shots he's probably got some 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 defensive fundamental things to work on coming out of juco where you're 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 just not you're not getting travis ford coaching defense to you um at that level even if you are a a top flight juco team um but but he he does disrupt a lot of shots he does rebound um he's really versatile so i think you can give him some marks and athleticism as well so i i think he does kind of fit what we're looking for in a few different ways and i don't think by any stretch that we'd be done in the front court either. Um, Cause I, you know, right now I don't think we're with, with, with vice out. We're not, we're not close to, to ready yet. Uh, another Billiken or not Billiken, but another player that the Billikens are linked to uh, has been very recently posh Alexander out of St. John's. Uh, this would be unbelievable, Pete. This is a big name, you know, like I, I think Ford kind of teased recently that we were in on um, a big name player. And and this to me would fit that bill. I mean, he was a big time recruit coming out of high school. And, um, I, you know, when, when you saw the tweet from Andrew Slater, it said Posh Alexander started 77 games for St. John's while earning Big East Defensive Player of the Year, Big East Freshman of the Year. He's been hearing from Seton Hall, UCF, Butler and St. Louis. Um, led the Big East in steals twice. He's a big time recruit. Um, you know, I guess they've got the coaching change there with Patino. Um, three seasons with with over ten points a game, over four assists a game, over two steals per game, and that's against Big East competition. Um, maybe not his best season this past year in terms of his his you know when you look at his slash line, not a not a very efficient player. Uh, but I think. This uh, this this is it's like one of those things where we just talked about Noland uh, last week. We didn't get as, into it as much this week, but he didn't put up efficient numbers at all at Oklahoma. And sometimes what you need is is to to be under a new system, a new coach, and um, and a fresh restart might just be what's in order. Um, but there's no question about this guy's talent, Zach. I mean, he he would be a really big get. Um, the only question I would have there is is how Medley fits in the picture um with with posh at the one i don't know if they want him to uh to kind of be the understudy for a year behind a guy kind of like i would i would have liked for him to do under Mm yuri collins or if maybe this is a signal that that medley's um letter of intent is maybe not as solid as it once was or you want to have two two three guards that can handle the ball 
I, Hey, I, I'm all for that. I'm just kind of, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering where everybody's at. Cause I just don't know. Yeah, I, I get it. It's, it's a cluster. Um, you know what I thought about, about Kashan Pryor is that I, and also like how many times did we watch our team, our big men get a rebound and then find Yuri Collins backwards mm. before, like, instead of pushing the ball on the break, they would find Yuri Collins to push yeah. the ball. And so like having a six ten guy that can pass, I'm all for that. Or not just pass, just start the break, just go get it. And that's go. right. So yeah, um, I, I definitely like that aspect, but uh, a couple more visits potentially from Booker time. I mean, maybe Posh Alexander's in there. Yeah. So the last time Ford talked to the media, um, you know, we, we, cause we just had prior on campus this weekend. Um, and, and he said he, he expected at least one, uh, as many as three this weekend. So I don't know if we had another guy or two come through. Um, and so, so, you know, maybe we did, I, I hope we did, or, or maybe we've got one coming soon. He said, they've also had at least two dozen zoom meetings with players. Um, and then, and then, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping when he was referring to that big time player that, that Alexander might be that, or, Hey, maybe it's somebody else. I don't know. Uh, but, but it's just, it was kind of interesting to hear some of his comments about that kind of stuff. And one of the things he also said, Zach, that I found interesting was that a lot of players now have NIL agents and they'll still just throw out six figure requests um so slew will right away when they get you know a number that's too big they'll just say they're out and focus on players i want to i want to quite clarify qualify all those affies does i want to take this quote because the way you said that and then the way you finished it i don't know if that's how i read it right i read it like if if a player comes in with an agent and says, give me some money to play mm. here, like that, that's the automatic out, not necessarily that they're the number, right? Like, is it is it the guys that are strictly Ooh. just looking for money? See, I read it as the number. I didn't read it as just having an agent. One of the guys who we were linked to, you know, we were one of many um, because he's, he's a he's a big recruiting target right now is Abu Usman from North Texas. Um, another big man, by the way, but I saw that he did have an NIL agent. He's also been talking to a lot of schools, but SLU was in, in the mix for him for a while. So I don't know if that's one of those situations or not, uh, but I did see it confirmed that, that he, he does have an agent representing him on the NIL yeah. piece of it. I, I can understand having an NIL agent, I guess. I just still think that's weird that like, we don't, we have to have certified NBA agents, but NIL agents are cool. Like whatever. <laughs> um, that's Yeah. That's, I, I don't know. Um, that's a good question. Whether they have to be certified as well. I'm not yeah. sure. Um, but I, I just like, I, I, I feel like you should have it to, to do the work for you after you get on the team. Right. Like they're just going to teams looking for a paycheck, right? I mean, that's yeah, essentially it's, it's, what we're looking at here. It, it's amazing what this has evolved into so fast compared to what uh, fans and schools uh, envisioned this being. It's it's so quickly becomes something completely different. It, it's either only fans or NIL collective at this point. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah uh, I, I, you know everybody had visions of local commercials in their heads and we're getting some of that but it's just it's operated way different differently oh, yeah. than, than than people expected team programs are hiring general managers now i mean it's... i can't wait for trey robertson to be announced as the general manager of billiken basketball think about all of the responsibilities that a head coach had before yeah. And how different it is now all of a sudden. Yeah. Like a, a GM makes a lot of sense now that it's been professionalized in this yeah. way. Pete, I have a confession. What's that, Zach? I agree with Izzo. You agree with Izzo? Yeah. I think this whole thing's just completely screwed. <laughs> it's, I mean. Well, I mean, it, the original sin is is amateurism in the first place, right? I mean, the, oh. the, the NCAA from its earliest days could have just let people 
cash in on their you know they could if they had just allowed a little it was bit different on, though dude there was no money back like way back like it's not like this is big like it's not like it just showed up and was, everybody was, was big, making money though college football was bigger than the nfl for decades like True. you know like like in, in in those early years like it was way bigger than the nfl but it was it was romanticized, right? It, of I mean, course. I, I don't I mean, even that's know why college NCAA... sports are as big as they are well, now. But was the NCAA romanticizing it, or was everybody else romantic? Like, were the were the players romanticizing it? Like, you know, I'm doing this for the love of the game. Like, you're Kevin Costner playing for the for the Tigers with uh, with John C. Riley catching. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess every every set of circumstances is going to be different. But I, I just look back on it like. This, this is a uh, it, it's a correction, right? It's like yeah. any time there's a societal or cultural or or structural. Everything's broken, Peter. We have to fix everything. It it, it it when things all happen at once, it's it's uncomfortable. It feels and and you know it's a lot of change at once, and everybody's uncomfortable with it. And you kind of feel you kind of throw your hands up and say, "I wish it was the way it was." You know, like this is it's a lot, but. I, I I've got to think that we're going to settle into a groove sooner or later because like, like it's such a brand new market and some of the money going around is silly, you know, especially for a sport like college basketball, that that really has become more of a niche than, than it used to be. And, and in comparison to, to other big time sports, um, I, I got to think we're going to settle into something soon where, where people kind of understand what the market's at. Cause right now, um, I think a lot of those NIL agents are just trying to see just how much they can get. And the number is being thrown around. I don't know how real they all are. Um, I, I know that they're being thrown around and I know that they're trying to make them real, but I just don't know how real they'll be at the end of the day, especially when say, say you've got a, a situation like, um, you know, Miami where you've got a, a billionaire who's just throwing as much money as he can at the program to have the team he wants it more or less worked for him this year. He got a final four team at SLU. On the other hand, you got to think there's some people looking at this, like we're not really getting good ROI here. Right. You know, so, so, so those experiences are going to kind of add up and the people who are funding the NIL are going to get a little restless. And I, and I, I think the the market will eventually settle into where it's going to be, but yeah, right now it's just a mess. Oh man. Dude, I like I legitimately have on many occasions like I think at some point I'm gonna have to like divorce myself, like my feelings, like my emotions from Billiken basketball, uh, except like in game. Like yeah. I just have to really just like get to the point where I don't give a shit until the ball's tipped. When the ball's tipped, then we go. But back to the when the, when the final whistle happens, I'm out. Like I'm out and then we record and I'm back in. Then I get out. Like I need to compartmentalize this. Easier said than done. I mean, like I, I just, I, the fact that there's, there's the emotional link of like, this is my school. This is where I, I went. These are where the best years of my life were that kind of thing. Like you can't shake that. Right. I mean, like that's always going to be there. The, the, the word romanticize that you use is, is apt. I mean, that, that's why we care so much. If we only cared around, about the best level of basketball you would only watch the nba and nothing else but it's it's not like that you know you get your your emotions involved and uh it's i don't know it's it's easier said than done but yeah there's there's definitely a, a world in which all of this goes sideways and it just makes all of it unappealing right i mean i i I believe these these guys always should have been allowed to make some money in some way, shape, or form. And a lot of the rules never really made sense to me. But this, yeah, I don't think anyone wanted this to be the way it was. I thought about this, like watching the NBA playoffs. Basketball is such a goofy sport with a, like adults playing it. Like I think it's the goofiest <laughs> looking sport for adults to play, like grown people. Like like baseball, I kind of get like it, they look everything looks right. Uh, hockey, you can't really tell how old the players are. Uh, soccer, they all skew younger anyway. But like basketball, like you see how old the dudes really are, and they're they're wearing tank tops until they're like fifty, which is fine, whatever. But it's just it's a, it's weird. It's a weird visual, man. Like 
it's a tiny court. These dudes are massive. It's weird. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I don't know why I thought about that today. Um, a couple of other odds and ends on the men's basketball side before we get into the latest A10 portal developments. We're coming up on about 45 minutes here, my dude. Yeah, we are. But, you know, Ford's he's doing individual practices with small groups of players. I don't know. I actually don't. I thought they changed the individual workout rules um, recently. Maybe they just changed the calendar on it. It used to be that one coach could work, um, could practice with up to four players. And we would kind of separate into, you know, guards, wings, bigs. Uh, back in the day and, and and one assistant would take those guys and you, there's a certain amount of hours a week you can do that in the off season and i think that's what's going on here uh, but the other thing is they're also working on the schedule for next season um it's it's really going to be interesting to see where that winds up i know they're working on an mte we talked about the one last week that we thought we might be in and don't know yet uh, we talked about last week the road games that we know we've got at siuc drake nc state so we've got those um, but it, I'm, I'm guessing we're not going to see the strength of schedule that we saw last season. The program just kind of feels empty right now, doesn't it? In, in empty in what sense? Like there's just really nothing to go off of. <laughs> I, I and I'm not saying like it's not going to end up anyway, or it's not going to end up fine or anything yeah. like that. It just doesn't feel like we have anything. Like I forget. Like, I don't know what our starting lineup is going to look like. I don't know what three of the five guys are going to look like. I don't, I don't know. Like the it's only weird... guy I know for sure is going to start is Gibson Jimerson. Mm -hmm. That's it. What? No, sincere Parker. I'm guessing. But again, if we're going for defensive. But even then you're thinking, well, you know, CJ Nolan's there, right? And and yeah. whoever is going to be playing point guard. So, yeah, I think there are still some question marks there. But it's it's a weird place to be um, for, you know, a seventh-year coach. Um, He's put himself in a shit position. Because now, like, you, you started 2022, 21, wait, 22, 23 season. And you have this team chock full of seniors. And again, I don't want to beleaguer, belabor, or beat a dead horse here. But you go into the season and you start, you think, I'm going to have a really good season. I'm going to go to the NCAA tournament and I'm going to be able to rebuild hmm. in a more sustainable way going forward. And so you recruit a a point guard to lead the program. You uh, that you can work from freshman to senior, like Yuri Collins. You get a guy like Vice, who it looks like he has a college ready body. Maybe he's not all the way ready to be that guy yet. Uh, you get a speculative guy like Brujong, who. Nobody knows anything about, like, again, I've seen more video of Zhang's dog on his Instagram than I've seen of him playing basketball, right? So now you get through the 22-23 season and you sucked. Mm -hmm. And the fans are restless. And whether or not you want to believe what Chris May said, I still think he chose the wrong words. I don't necessarily totally believe what he said. Uh, but again, he said the wrong thing. And of course, and of course, Dayton's AD comes out and says the right thing today uh, that fans would have wanted to hear um, come out of Chris May's mouth. Uh, but back to Travis Ford, it, he's put himself in a shit position because you now have to change your the way you view next season and you have to switch your focus to finding guys who are ready to go. Now you had to bring Gibson Jimerson back or you had to at least convince him to come back. Um, and now you're scrambling for guys that can come and play right away and help you win 25 games right away. This is also the worst possible year for that to happen because in any other year you could, a guy like Ford, 
could really recruit, you know, and, and whoever his staff mm-hmm. is at the time could really recruit those guys, right? And, and on a fairly level playing field. But now that's Even, expensive. Yes. It's expensive to like you can you can go ahead and recruit players that you think are going to be good in a couple of years or that that fit your culture or whatever. Oh, yeah. But if you want guys who are going to come in and help you win in, in a very real way right away, that's expensive now. No. And, and and this year more than ever. And so it, it, it's it's not just that we needed the season to be a success in the, in a way that it wasn't. It's that it couldn't have been worse timing um, in, in, in that regard, because now you have the ability to build instantly, but you got to pay for it. And, and that's something I just don't know that we're equipped to do. Uh, Peter, we're going to go over the latest A-10 portal development, but uh, you know who's not entering the transfer portal? We're not. We're not leaving two men in a garden. They're going to be around with us next season. We're going to be around with them next season. Um, and Pete, tell us why you love two men in a garden. They're reliable, Zach. I mean, like, uh, it, it's just when, whenever, and I, and I just had this situation this week, whenever I run out and have to go get salsa, pickles, whatever from the grocery store, uh, because I'm kind of in between orders, right? I, I need to be better about stockpiling, by the way. That's my own fault. Um, it's not the same. It's not the same. I'm, I'm, I'm always trying new grocery store salsas to kind of like figure out what's what's a good backup to have. And I just have never been 100% happy with any of those. <laughs> I, 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 I think we need to pitch them a signature brand, a signature style next year. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. You're just going to drop that on air. I'm thinking, <laughs> I, I'm th- I, hey, I'm, I, yeah, hey, I'll, I'll pitch it on air. I feel like yours would be a little too mild though. No, dude, no, we're going your heat, your heat sensibilities mm-hmm. with my texture sensibilities. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. I, it's, it, it, um, I, I, yeah, that's our pitch. And, and Pete, we, it's that, that sauce is obviously never coming out. Um, <laughs> but there are a lot of sauces and a lot of pickles they, that folks can get delivered expediently and tell them where they can get it delivered from human in the garden.com um you, you go right to their website 999 nationwide shipping in the top left corner is on there whatever you get um you won't be disappointed and 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 seriously to everyone listening to this um who has on account of our show gone out and bought their stuff giving them a shot um the feedback's been great and 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 thank you all for supporting it. And if you haven't yet, seriously check them out. Two men in a garden.com. As I mentioned, uh, we're gonna go down the A10 portal developments. Nothing out of Dayton or George Mason. Uh, Dayton seemed to be really having a big roster turnover. A lot of speculation about Duran Holmes potentially entering. Uh, Duke fans salivating at the idea. He followed. I, I I think there were some people who said he followed Tipton edits, I believe, on social media, and so a lot of people thought that it was coming soon. And uh, yeah, what was the whole Duke situation? It seemed like they had know. some fans who were trying to kind of make a pitch for him. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. But but, but re- regardless, uh, we still don't have anything official from him. Just a couple. I'm going to throw this out there because I forgot to mention at the top of the show, but Tipton edits. Uh, you know, I noticed like you, they do, you do a graphic when someone like passes away, right? Like how many years are we away from like Tipton edits doing like uh, in memoriam graphics for like <laughs> people, like athletes? Like, I mean, uh, is it like LeBron James when he passes in like 30 years, 40 years? Like, are we looking at Tipton edits doing a doing an announcement that that should be on their website like reserve yours now <laughs> write your own write your own uh announcement epitaph um i think that would that would that's a good market for them you know the take 50 percent now and then 50 percent later yes it's like that uh, guy in uh in uh, back to the future three measuring marty mcfly for his uh funeral suit there you go yeah <laughs> you gotta reserve yours now um 
some people are do like to think ahead uh like that uh with, with that being said if if this podcast ever ends we're doing a tip to edit to announce it yeah yeah last show <laughs> all right so you heard it here first that's a good idea but yeah nothing official on Holmes. nothing um this week out of mason this one was interesting zach another one from vcu heading to penn state to follow mike rhodes and this time it's nick kern man i really would have liked nick kern on this basketball team here in st louis but he's joining his uh his head coach who has been a gigantic troll uh in his departure from vcu which is kind of funny honestly um back to george mason though pd buckets came out at me or came at us for uh for being upset about uh or he said something about the uh the brock vice decommit and yeah. i you know as as a as a as a university that has never won anything in the a10 he should probably check himself you know i he's he's the only literally the only george mason fan i tolerate um <laughs> there are so so if we're gonna have anybody on the show in the future hopefully hopefully he didn't get under his skin too much or hopefully he forgets uh but regardless I think his comment was the only the my only thought on Brock Vice decommitting is that Brock Vice has an incredible name or something like that, um, which is you know whatever it's it's fair, uh, but yeah, you definitely clap back at him with uh, you know go go win something, dude, yeah, uh, which is completely fair. Uh, you had a couple other uh, Florida uh, exits, uh, one to Vis or one to Florida. State. State. sorry one exit and one uh one incoming transfer pete yeah so so vcu has uh, jameer watkins going to florida state um oddly not the only a10 guy going there this week uh but joe i can never say his name bams bamasil bamasil uh, bamasil from uh oklahoma is going to go to vcu that one kind of surprised me um he's he's a pretty good player and then another oklahoma guy coming into the conference benny schrader um, the German player from Oklahoma is going to George Washington. Uh, that's a pretty good get for them as well. Uh, LaSalle, uh, one of their transfers found a landing spot at Florida state uh, where his cousin coaches, apparently. Yeah. Josh Nickelberry. Um, when I saw that Kevin Nickelberry was hired at Florida state, I was like, Oh, his dad's been a college assistant. I had no idea. Um, his, uh, but it's his cousin, Kevin, who was at Georgetown on Patrick Ewing staff there and is now at Florida state. Um, nothing at Davidson Bonaventure or Fordham this week, but we do have Duquesne Devin Carney in the portal. Not, not, a, not big news there, but Quincy McGriff is going to UT San Antonio. Um, and then St. Thomas, we knew he was leaving Loyola. He's going to Northern Colorado. Really uh, missed out on an opportunity to go to St. Thomas. Uh, I, it seems like about that level too, right? You know, like 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 Big Sky <laughs> Summit, uh, fairly comparable, but uh, but yeah, Northern Colorado, he'll he'll get definitely more minutes there. And then, what do you think about this, Zach? Noah Fernandes from UMass is going to Rutgers. Um, I am I am shook. <laughs> <laughs> do I care? What do I think of it? I don't give a shit. I think I think he'll get a good opportunity there. Um, uh, it's Jersey. Who gives a hell? Who gives a crap? Rhode Island's got two guys coming in. Um, Zeke Montgomery from Bradley and uh, Luis Courtright from Quinnipiac. Uh, wasn't as familiar with him, but Zeke Montgomery, I think we actually may have recruited him a little bit. That's uh, the recently. NCAA hockey champion, Quinnipiac. Put some respect on their name. That's right. I was actually pretty excited to see them, them win it uh, after never having won it before. That's kind of fun. Um, and then you've got from St. Joe's Lewis Bleachmore is headed to Fairfield. And then this is probably the biggest one of the week, Zach. Um, Jason Nelson, the little, the little new point guard at, at uh, Richmond that kind of gave us fits this year, year um, announced that he would be transferring, which, uh, which was, you know, kind of surprising given that he looked like a pretty natural replacement for Jacob Gilliard um, and had a good season. But the rumor is he's going to VCU. I don't. I don't think that's official yet. But uh, but that's what I'm hearing. Any uh, any truth to that? Sounds like tampering to me. Death yeah, I mean, penalty that, to the Rams. 
That would be brutal, brutal for Richmond fans to have him go across town like that. Um, Pete, we do not have a trivia question for this week, but we are going to answer uh, last week's trivia question. Did we put it out on social media or did we forget? I think we forgot. Should we just... We, let's no, give it another week. Let's give it a week. Yeah, all right. The, the question is... Uh, again, okay, first of all, I need to apologize for A, ignoring the trivia, and B, not posting on Instagram. I started a new job. It's back in the office. I'm getting ready for my race as well. I have, I am trying. I am hanging on by a, by Vivance and other things. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Two major Billiken events happened in 1949. Name them. And then, and this week we won't forget. We'll put it out on our on our socials. Uh, on the women's side, there's some official commitments. Pete, well, I think we kind of a couple of these we knew about. Well, we we got that we announced them when they committed. Uh, I think a couple months back now, but uh, but now they've all signed, so it's official. Um, Tierra Simon, Markavia Shavers, and Brooklyn Gray. Um, they all signed as soon as the spring period opened on the 12th and all three of them actually committed on their official visit, which was the same day. So I think uh, Tillett said that's one of her favorite stories ever in terms of uh, recruiting. Gray's going to have three years of eligibility. She's coming in from Wabash Valley College in Illinois. Um, she led them to a 31 and two record this season. And coach Tillett said she's a really dynamic offensively confident playmaker and she can score too. So she thinks she's going to be a nice fit here. Um, and then Simon and Shavers will each have two years of eligibility left. They come from Pearl River Community College down in Mississippi. Um, of these two, Tillett said Shavers has toughness and physicality in the paint, both ends of the floor, and said she's really unselfish and a great teammate. Um, she said that Simon's versatile at both ends, plays kind of an inside-out game offensively, guards multiple positions defensively, and that she's a really good rebounder too. I think all of that's going to, you know, really be a big help for the team this year, you know, losing Brooke Flowers. They're just going to have a much different look to the front court. And I think she went for a little more toughness, physicality, strength, those kinds of things, and, and hopefully depth when all is said and done. But I, I, don't, I don't think she's done yet. Hearing the name Gray, the last name Gray made me think of whether or not we've ever had Last name the same as a former uh, women's basketball head coach. If we've ever had a a player with the same last name, and I think that's probably the only one. Well, we I can't imagine we've had a Pizzotti. Well, I'm talking about a former coach. Yeah, see, I was gonna say Tillett. Tillett now yeah. is a pretty uh, pretty easy one, but uh, but yeah, not that I'm aware of. No Grays or Millers. I can't. I can't. I would know if there was a Miller. Yeah, uh, and I would obviously like to think so. I, there was no Stones. Uh, and then I don't believe there was a Pizzotti anywhere in there. No, um, and I have not. no idea who came before Pizzotti. You could not. I did have no clue. <laughs> um, baseball. Uh, actually, well, let's talk baseball and softball because the brooms were out at the Billiken Sports Center. Uh, six total wins uh, racked up by both baseball and softball in the in the bat and ball sport. Uh, Patrick Cloacy, though, was named A-10 Player of the Week for the second time this season. Uh, he was mashing last week, and um, spoiler alert, still mashing. Yeah. Yeah, he kept it going, man. I mean, that, like, yeah, there, there's no surprise that he won that award. He, it's he like absolutely a beach ball. It. Right, yeah. They, he's seeing the ball really well right now. And it came out on Tuesday 11th. I mean, this was... Uh, it wasn't just him hitting in this one, though. I mean, this was this was everybody getting in on the action. And, and Zach, this was midweek baseball at its best. 16-11. Stupid game. Stupid game. 16-11 win at Southern Indiana on Tuesday the 11th. Slew had a season-high 21 hits from 11 different players. The teams combined, this is my favorite number of the game, to use 17 different pitchers. Um, Stupid. Southern Indiana committed seven errors. And the Stupid. game lasted 4.06. Four hours and six minutes did not go to extra innings. Stupid. St <laughs> it was tied at five after four innings. Slew then proceeded to score 10 over the next three innings. 
Uh, USI did get back, get six back in the bottom of the seventh, but it stupid. wasn't enough. Yeah, uh, just a stupid game. Hayden Moore scored five times, which is tying a school record that now seven different players hold. Uh, I most bet recently, all of those were midweek games. That would be fun to go look up. I mean, the, the last one's pretty recent, Cam Redding in 2021. Um, Dom Cusimano went four for five with two RBIs and a run. Tyler Fogarty, three for four with three runs. Somehow no Billiken had more than two RBIs, so they really spread out the action in this one. Somehow Grant Fremion emerged with the win. I mean, it was, it was you know, who knows who was going to get it in this game. And then uh, Southern Indiana somehow had 11 runs on eight hits. I mean, this is just, again, midweek college baseball at its best. Love it. Uh, as I mentioned, the brooms were out, uh, four to started off with a four to two win versus St. Joe's on Friday, the 14th, Chloe Sitzman each went two for four with Chloe adding two RBIs and a run and Sitzman with an RBI. Henry Littman took home the win, giving up two earned runs in six and a half innings. Ethan Bell finished the game and gave up just one hit. All of Slew's run came, runs came in the bottom of the second. Uh, a couple base runners, a sack fly, a double, a single, just stringing some things together. Outside of that inning, it was a very quiet game offensively. Uh, that would change in the second game, Peter. 10 to 6 was the win against St. Joe's on Saturday, the 15th. Uh, Cam Redding in this one, Zach, he drove in six runs, including a grand slam. He got the story, scoring started in the first inning with an RBI double, and then his grand slam led a five-run fourth inning that gave Slew an 8-1 to one lead. And then he had a solo shot later in the game. St. Joe's, to their credit, didn't quit. You know, they added six in the or three in the sixth and two more in the eighth. But Slew tacked on a couple more insurance runs in those innings as well, including that solo shot that we just mentioned. Tyler Fogarty went to a five with two RBIs. Two runs and a home run. Cloacy, Knox Preston, Dom Cusimano all had two hit days as well. Owen Chafin got the win. Jack Weber took home the save in long relief in this one. And uh, the bats kept coming on Sunday, Zach, against St. Joe's. Yeah, 14-8 win versus St. Joe's Sunday the 16th. Billikens jumped out to a 10-0 lead with damage in the second and third on the backs of RBIs for Moore, Cloacy, Preston, Newig, and Sitzman. Patrick Close, he made the most of his five at-bats in this one with three RBIs on four hits. Billikens really won this game offensively on small ball and rallies. Not a single Billiken homered in this one. Jackson Holmes gets the win in this one. He goes 2-0, and and the Billiken baseball team goes to 12-11 and overall, 8-1 and in conference, and no doubt sitting atop the A-10 standings. 22 and 11 overall. Sorry, I did say that, right? You said 12 and 11 overall. Ah, shit. Because I was just looking at how close they are to coming up yeah. on uh, on last season's uh, win total, which was 29. So oh, wow. could happen in just a few weeks here, uh, um, especially yeah, next, if they keep hitting like this. Uh, next up, it's uh, the Arch Baseball Cup, the Arch Baron Baseball Cup, the ABBC, uh, at Dayton, April 21st through the 22nd. Uh, Pete Softball had a midweek game uh, that didn't go their way. It was the only loss this week against, uh, you know, anybody for the baseball or softball teams. And it was a close one, 4-3 against Eastern Illinois on Wednesday the 12th. Um, EIU rallied in the bottom of the seventh to take the win. Chloe Wendling pitched four scoreless innings and Kaylee Hanner. Um, and I'm wondering, Zach, is it Kylie or Kaylee? Because I've seen them abbreviated huh? as K-A-I, which I would think is Kai, but I don't know. Uh, oh, I should, wow. we should really figure that out. But anyway, oh. she, she gave up, she gave up four runs and two and two thirds innings of relief. Um, Abby Mallow hit her eighth home run of the season, which tied her for the A-10 lead. Um, Slug unfortunately could only muster four hits and one walk in this one. So they were kind of lucky to come up with three runs, to be honest, given the overall offensive picture. But luckily Fordham came to town and uh, their fortunes really turned around. Yep, 8-0 win uh, Saturday the 15th in game one of a doubleheader. Billiken scored five in the first, including a grand slam from Ashley Marietta, a name we have not heard a lot of uh, from the box score. She ended up going three for three with five RBIs. Uh, Slew had eight runs on eight hits. Fordham had no runs on nine hits. 
Uh, Wendling went the distance for the shutout in this one. Uh, Pete, the pitching uh, and defense continued in game two. Yeah, it was a pitcher's duel. Um, one nothing win against Fordham in game two. The only run of the game came in the bottom of the fourth uh, when Kelsey Etling's RBI single sent Abby Mallow home. Um, really, the story of this one is is a gem of an outing from Hanner, who pitched a one-hit, eight-strikeout, complete game shutout. Um, she did walk two and hit two batters, but Fordham just wasn't able to ca- capitalize on any base runners. By the way, Zach, um, Ashley Marietta is a freshman, so uh, no wonder we haven't heard her name yet. But, uh, but yeah, welcome to college, and uh, congrats on that first Grand Slam. The last game of the series on Sunday the 16th, Zach, uh, another close one. Yeah, this one uh, got a little weird. Uh, 8-7 win versus Fordham on Sunday. Um, sorry, I'm also trying to pull up the schedule because, of course, we didn't put the uh, their current record in there. That's my fault. Um, Billikens took an early lead in this one two, on a two-run single by Konecki and, Fordham, and a Fordham wild pitch in the second and third innings, respectively. Fordham snatched the lead back in the fifth with four runs, but that lead didn't last long as Billikens get five runs on three homers in the bottom of the half of the fifth. I think it went homer, uh, runner gets gets on base, or batter gets on base, homer, homer. I think that's kind of how it went. Um, A three-run homer in the top of the seventh from Fordham threatened the Billiken lead, but perhaps the home run stalled the rally as Callie Hanner got Allie Clark to ground out to second to close this game out. Uh, Pete, next up is a doubleheader versus Loyola on Wednesday the 19th in a weekend series at St. Joe's on the 22nd and 23rd. A rare midweek conference game, Pete. Yeah, and a rare midweek doubleheader, too. That's yeah. It's an odd one, but... Um... I think is is any of that a makeup? I wanted. I thought they had a game against Loyola earlier this year that. Um, um, and it, I I'm I think I'm mistaken. I, I thought they had, yeah. had one to make up, but uh, nope. yeah, looking looking back, I think I'm wrong there. Um, anyway, regardless, men's tennis uh, didn't well, hold, play hold up, hold up, hold up. They got the, they got a uh, St. Joe's on the twenty second and twenty third, and you, you, their, you, uh, their you record no that. no their record. Oh yeah. Is now 18 and 22, uh, All but right. 10 and four in conference. They are battling for that top spot. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they're 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 definitely in the mix in conference. Uh luckily the the A is pretty wide open. Now we can now, talk about the, the racket sports. Yeah, there you go. Men's tennis didn't play this week, and they've got uh, Northern Illinois on Monday the 17th. Uh women's tennis, though, had a very busy week. Um, started out with a 4-2 win over Kansas City at the Dwight Davis Tennis Center on the 11th. Um, Elizabeth Mintusova and Maya Spencer both won in singles and doubles uh, to lead slew to victory. Um, and then both of them, along with Jacqueline oh, the Joy, were honored mm-hmm. for Senior Day. Uh, she's got a lot of vowels in her last name. I don't. Yeah, know I, I don't. Even I don't have that one. Yeah, and she doesn't. She's not really part of the main rotation either. So. Uh, so we don't run into her name a whole lot, but nonetheless, happy senior day to everybody. Uh, Zach, then they had Bradley on Thursday. Yeah, a 7-0 win at Bradley on the 13th. Slu swept the singles with only one match going to a third set, and they won two of the three doubles matches with the other one going unfinished. That still blows my mind that they don't finish matches. I know. Um, I I can't even I don't I think we always played them out in high school. Um, so that's different. It's a time uh, thing, right? Like as soon as they hit a certain time, they have to. No, it's uh, literally the match is over. Well, hmm. I think it's probably it, it prob it's it could be a time thing, or it could be just the the match is over. Like, I think it's a combination of both. Is what I'm saying. Okay. All right. Like yeah. if it's gone on and they're just like, well, it's seven zero. You know, we'll we won't we'll just end the one that's taken forever. Got it. Okay. So like you're saying that it's, it's decided the overall competition is decided. So like a travel curfew or whatever. Sure. (laughs) All right. Uh, Yeah. They, they kind of were brought down earth. They've had a great record, but you go on the road and play an sec tennis team. um, You're, you're going to have some troubles. 
Yeah, and they lost six to one at Mizzou on uh, on Saturday the fifteenth. Sandra Gines was SLU's only winner from the number six single spot. Um, Norhan Hashem just barely lost in the two spot. Uh, that one went down to the wire, uh, but unfortunately she couldn't come out with that. Um, now they're sixteen and six on the season, matching their highest win total since twenty seventeen. And they've only had a few seasons with more wins than 16. I think they they hit 20 once, they hit 17 a few times, and that's it. Um, the next match for them will be Thursday the 20th against Duquesne in Dayton, Ohio, which will close out the regular season. That one, I know for a fact, was rescheduled. That was supposed to be a few weeks ago. Um, and why they're playing in Dayton, I don't quite know. But that's how it was scheduled before as well. Interesting. I I was I was gonna guess that maybe they were gonna play a, a three team MTE type deal, but yeah, but for conference play, I mean conference uh, for tennis is very different. You barely even weird. play the teams in your conference before you see them at uh, you know the A ten championship. So, uh, but I know they they already played at Dayton. Uh, regardless, I think that's one of the only teams in conference they did play. Yeah, track and field uh, split this weekend. Uh, some are at the Cal State LA Twilight Open, uh, including uh, Emily Nichols. Uh, I believe she's out there. Mm -hmm. uh, they were scheduled to run at the Mount Sac San Antonio College Relays in Walnut, California. Yeah, so that's what was scheduled. Wait, originally. why is San Antonio College in California? It's Mount San Antonio College. It's not a D1 school. Okay. It's called Mount San Antonio. <laughs> My little <laughs> brain could, cannot handle this. They call it Mount Sac for short. So so the Mount Sac relays in Walnut, California. Um but there is, is what a they Sac. had. There, there is San, San Antonio College. There there actually is one in San Antonio. That's sure. why I'm confused. Yeah. Gotcha. Sorry. You go ahead. You finish us off because I'm I'm absolutely distraught over. If you here. looked at the schedule a couple of weeks ago, that's what was on there. So that's what we had previously announced. Mm -hmm. And that got replaced with the Cal State uh Twilight Open and the Brian Clay Invitational, which was at Azusa Pacific University in Azusa, California. Now that one makes sense. Yes. Very much makes sense. When you use the town name in the school, yes. that, that, that helps. Yeah. Um, and that one was cool because Toby Gillen set the school record for the 1500 with a time of 342 flat, uh, breaking Tannic Blair's previous mark by almost seven seconds. Uh, Toby Gillen, Zach, is just running out of his mind right now. Are, are um, we going to have the second Billiken to be an Olympian uh, at, ooh, in Australia? That would be amazing. I mean, he he he's trending that direction for sure. He he really is. Um, inc just having an incredible season, and uh, it's just been a joy to watch that happen. The rest of the team that didn't make it out there ran at the Cougar Classic at SIUE on the fifteenth, and then next up they've got the Gary Weinicke Memorial at Illinois on the twenty first and twenty second. Um, women's soccer. Uh, interesting situation with them uh they canceled the game at mizzou or sorry versus mizzou at herman stadium on the 15th due to injuries and player availability something that we have hinted at being a problem this spring pete yeah and do we know yet are they going to play the game on the 19th because their next one is scheduled for the 19th against central missouri their next spring I, game i wonder if i hadn't heard i wonder if it wasn't necessarily numbers for the game but numbers for two games you know okay. what I mean? Like they they had the numbers to play one game a week, but not necessarily two games a week. Got it. Okay. All right. So, so they like might you, they they might have players like on a restriction, but not like completely. Uh, yeah, like you play, unavailable. you would play what like so, so your your first team of most of the Mizzou game, and then play your second team most of the the Central Missouri game, or something like that. Sure. Got it. Okay. The other, the other thing I wanted to get at here besides their next game coming up, um, they had a cool experience this week with the women's national team yeah, playing they did. in St. Louis. Uh, not only did the whole team go to that game against Ireland at city park and take it in and I'm sure have a blast. It was a good game. U S won and everything. Uh, Lindsay Horan, um, Christy Mewis and Sophia uh, Huerta. Uh, I always 
pause on her last name, but uh, they all came by practice and uh, they, they, you know, they got a team photo and everything. And that, that's, that's pretty cool to have three, uh, you know, pretty high level, you know, stars of the U S women's national team come by take in practice. I mean, what an experience for all of them. That's obviously what they're all shooting for in their own careers. Um, and, and it's just, just an incredible thing to happen. And it was cool to see them come out. So, um, big week for the women's team, even though they, they unfortunately had to abandon their weekend game. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully they're all getting healthy and where they need to be for another big season this fall. Well, Pete, that does it for this episode. We actually got out of here earlier than I thought we were going to, that we were trending along and, but I think, I think we always want to try to. Uh, bring an hour of content basketball wise, at least every week. Um, If, if nothing else. So uh, I think we did that. So uh, that wraps up the week in Billiken athletics. Follow us on Twitter at Midtown mad pod at Peter is a tweeter at Zach Miller, MMP and on Instagram at Midtown mad pod. We appreciate any and all suggestions you might have for the show. Go subscribe on all platforms if you haven't left a review, do that uh, as well as five stars. Pete, whether or not players are on a mass exodus or we're going to the national championship game, go Bills. Go Bills. <laughs>